from violence to peacemaking, community of Christ, the repenting faith, uh, presentation given at Coventry University on the 18th of November, 2020, at the Center for Trust, Peace and Social Relations. We are honored to present today in the virtual shadow of Coventry Cathedral with its message of reconciliation. In Coventry, you are also only 15 miles from the birthplace of George Fox, the founder of Quakerism. We want to tell the story of how Community of Christ, a small church birthed on the American frontier in the 19th century, is turning from its early violence to becoming a contemporary international peace church today. Our objectives are as follows. Understanding who Community of Christ is, confessing our history of violences with racism, misogyny, and nationalism. How have we tried to address the violences? And exploring what more still need to do, we need to do to become a contemporary peace and justice church. First, what is our place in the Christian world? We descended from Protestant Christianity in the United States in the early 19th century with both continuities and innovations. One continuity expressed in many Protestant denominations was that we were a movement seeking to restore radical New Testament Christianity that has a message for the poor and marginalized. Our innovations, a prophet leader receiving revelation from God through Joseph Smith Jr. in the period 1830 to 1844. He produced two new books of scripture in addition to the Bible, the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants. We in Community of Christ were part of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints until 1844 when Joseph Smith was assassinated. The church then divided. One group went uh, to Utah under Brigham Young and became the Mormon Church. We, a group of dissenters, stayed in the American Midwest and became known as the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or for short, the Reorganization. We were led initially by Joseph Smith's son, Joseph III. We identified with early Latter-day Saintism, the period when we were seeking to live out a radical New Testament Christianity. We rejected the later Nauvoo Latter-day Saintism of authoritarian leadership, militarism, and polygamy. In 2001, we changed our name to Community of Christ, a better name for a self-critical, repentant, and progressive religious movement that grew out of Latter-day Saintism. Jesus had become normative for us, not Joseph Smith, Jr. A faith community or church does not operate in a vacuum. We swim in a sea of contesting value systems and ideologies expressed economically, socially, politically, and ecologically. Resurgent nationalisms, hypermasculinity, and white supremacies all have grounding in bad theology and are unrepentant ideologies that continue to find root in people's belief systems and worldviews. They are all forms of idolatry that elevates the nation, men, and the white race above others. They are all collective egotisms and thus sinful. They divide the human family into us versus them. They betray the biblical truth that all humans are equally made in the image of God, that Christ died for all, and that the equal worth of all persons is a fundamental Christian and community of Christ value. A US birthed faith with a violent past like Community of Christ is not a hopeful beginning. But what happens when it becomes an international church and turns repentantly towards peace and justice? Are there certain features about our faith movement that have to be replaced and that need to go? Do we continue without self-criticism with the same theologies, the same ideas, the same rhetoric? Or do we seek to transform ourselves and the neighborhoods and families and communities that come in contact with us. Today, we are a church with approximately 250,000 members across the world, 
established in more than 60 nations. We also have a cathedral like Coventry. We call it a temple. It is dedicated to peace, reconciliation, and healing of the spirit, and is located in Independence, near Kansas City in Missouri. Our mission statement is to proclaim Jesus Christ and promote communities of joy, hope, love, and peace. This is our simple summary of the New Testament message. We seek to live out what that means. We are a people that loves to sing, and our hymnal is sometimes described as a fourth book of scripture that is replaced every 30 years. In 2013, we launched a new hymnal with more than 660 hymns, many considered by ministers from other churches as gutsy. We believe that our songs continue to shape us into becoming who we are called to be. These hymns represent our theology, a theology that we breathe in and sing out, that fashions our dreams and our longings for a world where we truly have beaten our souls into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks. This picture was taken at Greenbelt, a Christian arts and social justice festival in the UK in August 2019, where we had a group sing in a closing worship. Our story begins with a 15-year-old youth reading from the Bible, James 1, 5, and then praying for wisdom in a grove of trees on a beautiful spring morning in 1820, 200 years ago this year. Joseph's spiritual experience that launched his journey. Joseph Smith was from a family that had fallen on hard times. He was semi-literate. His poverty and marginalization influenced his theology. His theology was first expressed in story, narrative theology, in the saga of the Book of Mormon. Protestant historian Nathan Hatch said this, the Book of Mormon is a document of profound social protest in Passion Manifesto by a hostile outsider against the smug complacency of those in power and the reality of social distinctions based on wealth, class, and education. The church was formed on the 6th of April, 1830, in Fayette, New York. The waves of industrial capitalism were already buffeting Joseph Smith's world and that of his peers. Located in the district, it was already an area of religious upheaval and new forms of social experiments. Eight months later, Smith was joined by Sidney Rigdon, a powerful preacher, a Churches of Christ minister, who brought the concept of the restoration of primitive Christianity and had founded communities already sharing all things in common. They were Christian utopian or socialist experiments based on act two. Rigdon was influenced by hearing Robert Owen, a Welshman and a utopian socialist known for his new Lanark Mill experiment in Scotland, and for later attempting to found a utopian community in New Harmony, Indiana, just a few years before. U.S. culture then and now is an island culture. The Saints were driven out of Jackson County, Missouri, where approximately 1,000 members were living communally. Up to November 1833, church members were not in the spirit of the Sun on the Mount. They loved their enemies. The first five years then, from 1828 to 1833, were a non-violent period of the church. Then we began to retaliate with violence. <clears throat> the other place of gathering to live in utopian Christian communities was in Kirtland, Ohio. This is where Sidney Rigdon was living in December 1830 when he joined the church. The church here grew to 2,000 members by 1837. The model or blueprint for the church was the New Testament, especially Acts 2 and 4, and included radical economic sharing. The early members talked of Zion. By this, they meant the kingdom of God on earth. They were trying to abolish poverty in their midst by the practice of stewardship, consecration, and a communal storehouse. They sang of a world without war. It was also from Kirtland in 1837 that the first missionaries came to the British Isles and shared the radical Kirtland 
understanding of the gospel to eager working class audiences. By 1851, 60% of all Latter-day Saints were living in Britain and 80% of all Latter-day Saints were British born and baptized. Slavery was a big issue in the United States and in Missouri. Early church members tended to be abolitionists and that's not why there was such hostility against them in Missouri, a slave state. However, we flip-flopped on this issue. Because of persecution, a statement supporting slavery was published in the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants. But in 1844, Joseph Smith's manifesto as a candidate for US president included emancipation of slaves through compensation of slave owners and that to be achieved by 1850. Today, we are two thirds black or brown in our global membership, but we confess that racism continues to be an issue for us. Our congregations in the United States, Australia, Canada and Britain are overwhelmingly white. The church began in 1830 in the time of the Trail of Tears, the forced marches of Native Americans from their lands in the east to Oklahoma. Many died on the way. In contrast, the Book of Mormon speaks well of Native Americans. According to the Book of Mormon saga, they were descended from the tribes of Israel and were equal partners in the project of Zion, the kingdom of God on earth. Today, a literal interpretation would be considered by many of us as colonial, giving a false and imposed literal history and identity upon Native Americans. We want to say a little bit about scripture in general. The Bible is our foundational text. It is more important than any other scripture. It is the Jesus of the New Testament that is normative for us. We read all scripture through the lens of the Jesus of the New Testament. We're not literalists and we don't have fundamentalist approaches to scripture. A text must be read in its written historical context. A scandal for Latter of Latter-day Saintism for many Christians is the Book of Mormon. We would like now to go deeper on a critical and repurposed community of Christ view of the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon can be viewed as a message of repentance to those of European descent in terms of how they should treat marginal groups. Although for community of Christ, belief in the Book of Mormon has never been a measure of our Christian discipleship, nor a test of fellowship, it is worth mentioning it and delving a bit into its origins. We have had problems with its original historical claims and I've had to change our mind. This is part of what it means to be a repentant faith community. The Book of Mormon was originally believed to be translated from golden plates given to Joseph Smith Jr by an angel named according to the official records as Moroni. Moroni was considered also to be the last of the Nephites. The Nephites were the dominant people in a story between Nephites and Lamanites that were constantly at war with each other. The Lamanites were identified by Joseph Smith as the ancestors of Native Americans who had previously fled from Jerusalem and arrived in the new promised land, the ancient Americas. The story presents Jesus as the savior of the whole world and therefore also of other peoples than the ones he taught while in the flesh in Galilee and Jerusalem. The artwork we want to emphasize here is not the white Norwegian Jesus. That is not an adequate portrayal of incarnation. So we have chosen a Jesus that represents the peoples he would have visited in the narrative presented by Joseph Smith Jr. The Book of Mormon comes with a major problem. It is full of graphic violence, war, and bloodshed. Army generals are not only the main characters in the book, but also its main spiritual writers. Many readers of the Book of Mormon have traditionally seen these characters as divinely inspired, not only in their relationship to the divine, but also on the battlefield. Just war theory in the Book of Mormon is often used by its believers to justify US participation in warfare on the conditions of fighting for a better cause meaning the freedom of family, religion, and country. It has been read as an American patriotic book. 
Few and far in between are those that read the Book of Mormon as a text of peace and justice. Only more recent scholarship in the last 25 years has moved away from the controversial historical claims that the book otherwise makes and have tried to look at what the text itself actually says. What were the concerns of Joseph Smith's growing theology in the 1820s? What were the questions of his day that he would attempt to answer with such a book? And more importantly, perhaps, how does the book address the issues of war, violence, economic injustice, and poverty? In fact, the book makes passionate pleas for holding all things in common, for turning the other cheek when, when smitten, as a text with biblical origins, when read with the original biblical message in mind, the Book of Mormon provides a profound negation of violence and inequality. Andrew and I have been advocates for the continued use of the Book of Mormon in a contemporary peace and justice church like Community of Christ, because we see in its text stories that help us frame the moral and ethical discourses of today's society. They are stories, parables perhaps, biblically inspired narratives, but nonetheless, they help us reframe the struggles of our own society, especially in the last century of US imperialism, the empire of our day. What are the dangers of continued militarism, the rise of nationalism, of continued us versus them thinking, of policies that separate rather than unite? Moroni, the last of the Nephites after the death of his father, Mormon, is left alone to write the sad tale of destruction of his people. The Book of Mormon warns us by its tragic ending of the dangers of violence. Although the Book of Mormon is ambiguous for us today because quoting from it would implicitly make people think we are Mormons, it is worth explaining that the Book of Mormon itself presents humanity with a choice a great and marvelous work of peace and social justice, or a dreadful day of destruction and captivity in the logic of empire. Moroni ends the Book of Mormon with a message as if he spoke from the dead, as a voice crying from the dust. The tragic ending of the Book of Mormon is a moving account. Who are the real voices crying from the dust today to us so that we might be wiser? What would the testimonies of the dead who have suffered in the last 200 years from conflict, civil war and genocide cry unto us? What are their testimonies against us to God? What other questions should we ask ourselves and what other questions does the Book of Mormon ask of us? One of them is what manner of men ought you to be? This is a rhetorical question Jesus asks of his disciples in an imagined visit to the ancient peoples of the Americas. Even as I am, he responds, proposing his own nonviolent masculinity and peaceful humanity as an example for all disciples of Jesus to follow. The book thus points us towards the New Testament narrative, towards the Jesus of the Gospels, and lifts him up as the savior of the world not its prophet generals and the service to empire. As already mentioned, reactive violence became a strategy for the early leaders of our church movement from November 1833 onwards. In 1838, there was a war in Northern Missouri between the locals and early church members. Governor Boggs of Missouri issued his infamous extermination order in October 1838 saying, Church members were to be driven from Missouri or be exterminated. We were ethnically cleansed. This extermination order was not rescinded until 1976, 138 years later. We arrived as refugees just over the Mississippi River in Illinois. A traumatized people with a traumatized leader began to build a new city called Nauvoo. The city state of Nauvoo that rivaled Chicago in size, had an army of 5,000 men with Joseph Smith as Lieutenant General. In comparison, the US Army of the day had 8,000 men, just 3,000 more. The city of Nauvoo was a militarized city with nearly every able-bodied man in the militia. Armies are patriarchal and hierarchical, and women are vulnerable and at the bottom. 
as rape happens nearly twice as much in the US Army today as outside. So the situation was ripe for abuse against women in Nauvoo. Polygamy began secretly among church leaders. Today we would call it clergy abuse, or version of Me Too. The biblical standard in Nauvoo was no longer Jesus and New Testament, but a distorted form of Old Testament, with the polygamous warrior King David as the model rather than Jesus. Women with Emma Smith, the wife of Joseph, protested against polygamy and with some success. Dissent in Nauvoo was also expressed through the Nauvoo Expositor on the 7th of June, 1844. This has been called the founding document of the reorganization of Community Christ. This first and only edition of the newspaper contained an expose of polygamy, financial fraud, and criticism of Joseph Smith's autocratic leadership style by a witness who was part of Smith's inner circle. The newspaper was closed down immediately by Joseph Smith, but this was then followed by a huge outcry against Joseph Smith by Nauvoo's neighbors who shouted, freedom of the press. Joseph and Hiram Smith with others were jailed in Carthage nearby. On the 27th of June, 1844, a mob stormed the jail, assassinated Joseph and his brother Hiram. This led to a time of confusion with no clear leader. The largest group under Brigham Young went west to the Rocky Mountains to found eventually the state of Utah. They kept the name of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and became known as Mormons. This branch of the church continued Nauvoo authoritarian leadership, the Nauvoo Legion, polygamy, and with continuing speculation about the nature of God. Community of Christ has always been consistently critical of Nauvoo and its continuation in Utah. The reorganization, a group rejecting the Brigham Young model, began in the Midwest. They were a dissenters group, rejecting authoritarian leadership and thus democratic, fiercely against polygamy and still holding on to the New Testament model of the church from the earlier Kirtland era. Perhaps surprisingly, the reorganization eventually gathered around Joseph Smith's son, Joseph III. But Joseph III was more his mother's son than his father's boy. Joseph then led the reorganization for 54 years from 1860 to 1914. The reorganization grew to over 70,000 members by 1914. Joseph III was 12 when his father and uncle were assassinated. He saw the grief of his mother in addition to knowing his own grief. His family stayed in Nauvoo, even though the rest of the church was driven out in 1846. And eventually he became justice of the peace and ran for mayor. He saw that accommodation with his neighbors was possible. When he became the leader of the reorganization, the United States was then plunged into five years of the American Civil War. By the end, he and others understood war's awful reality. He took the reorganization in a peace direction in multiple ways, including developing the peace seal, which has become the logo of the church. This first logo you can see on the slide here. Joseph Smith III also forgave Thomas Sharp, the person probably more than anyone else responsible for his father's death. His last editorial for the church magazine in 1914, before the out, after the outbreak of World War I, was to support the neutrality of the United States. Community of Christ and the beginning of its peace mission was born out of the failure of violence, consciousness of its tragedy, the influence of a Christian mother, and Joseph III's own commitments. Finally, Joseph III had some legal training and understood due process. So he enabled debate in church conferences, was unafraid of it, trusted good outcomes over the long term, and a more united body as a result. 
he presided with wisdom, dignity, and pragmatically over a church of dissenters. The focus of the reorganization was the New Testament. They called it the Old Jerusalem Gospel. F.M. Smith, the next president of the reorganization, was a son of Joseph III. He embraced muscular Christianity, a movement in the 1920s that you had to be manly about your Christianity. But he was also enthusiastic about the social gospel movement, that the message of Jesus had relevance for economics, social conditions, and politics. It was compatible with the tradition of Zion that F.M. Smith had inherited. However, he was also a patriot, a nationalist, who supported war against Germany in World War I and World War II. In contrast, F. Henry Edwards, a British member, was a conscientious objector in World War I. The two met, and despite their very different stands on war, got on. And F. Henry Edwards also became a significant church leader, and later married F. M.'s daughter, Alice. 1960 was a key year. The church began in Japan and Korea, and then globalized from 12 countries to 60 countries today. A growing international consciousness is important in our peace mission journey. Charles Neff was a key leader at this time. He was a convert who'd been a landing craft captain in World War II and was in Hiroshima three weeks after the bomb had been dropped. He said he would rather go to prison than war again. He protested against nuclear weapons at the beginning of the 1980s and spoke about considering tax resistance at a church conference for which he got in trouble. Today, with a presence in 60 countries, with a quarter of a million members, what can we do? Can we do anything scattered as we are across the globe? Where could we turn for inspiration? Dietrich Bonhoeffer and the confessing church movement's resistance to Hitler and Nazi Germany is perhaps one potential inspiration. Bonhoeffer was deeply Christian, as is so evident in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, published in 1937. Bonhoeffer was not taken in by Nazi ideology at all because of his deep Christian grounding. He was imprisoned and then executed by the Nazis. He goes the way of the cross in his resistance. He defended Jews against Nazi intentions. We should join others to make Auschwitz the central focus of Europe. We should join with others to make sure Auschwitz never happens again. Who would we naturally join and work with? Quakers are both inspiration and easy partners because of their consistent peace testimony for nearly 370 years. They are not upset with our Latter-day Saint roots as Christian evangelicals often are. Quakers share generously when we ask for conversations and support. They have a long history of both theory and practice of peacemaking and seeking justice that we can learn from. The Anabaptist movement, including Mennonites, are also hospitable and warm in their friendships with us. The Mennonites in 1534 to, 30, to 35 suffered the equivalent of Nauvoo, Illinois, in the city of Munster, Westphalia in Germany. That helps them understand our distrust and embarrassment about Nauvoo. Both Quakers and Mennonites are self-critical and have a tradition of community. Last year, Community of Christ joined the network of Christian peace organizations in Britain. In Leicester, we are working to see if we can bring together Buddhist groups, Ahmadiyya Muslims, Jains, Quakers, secularists, and humanists, and ourselves in a peace coalition. The academic discipline, peace studies, is an important part of our journey. We intentionally seek to learn from theoreticians and practitioners who effectively pursue justice nonviolently. The International Community of Christ Award has been given since 1994. Recipients have included John Paul Ledrack, Howard Zare, and Leigh McBowie. Adult peace education happens through peace colloquies, our week-long summer family camps and retreats. We have just finished a series of nine webinars for the European Peace Colloquy with audiences ranging from 115 to nearly 300. 
The Peace Pavilion and Peace Mobile are children's peace education programs. Outreach International is the church's humanitarian development organization. It uses a community organizing model developed originally by Saul Alinsky in Chicago and adapted in the Philippines to successfully work there and elsewhere in the global south. Outreach International began in the Philippines in 1979 and with a totally Filipino staff. It now works in what, 10 countries in the Americas, Africa and Asia with 162 field programs. Saul Alinsky said he learned most from the notorious miners union leader, John L. Lewis, and Lewis's parents both came from Wales and were members of Community of Christ. The Leicester congregation is part of Leicester Citizens UK, which also uses a community organizing model, and Keith Hebden, the pioneering organizer, received the church's European Peace Award in October this year. Our most recent history has been that of a tremendous transition, at times very difficult. We realized that we were faced with a choice, Jesus or Joseph, and chose to go with Jesus. Our theological ongoing discernment has been focused on who Jesus is and the context in which Jesus lived. What was Christ's mission to the world? What is then a church's role in the world? Becoming Jesus-centered has been a remedy for many of the wrong decisions we have made in the past. Becoming Jesus-centered means also that we are oriented towards the vision of God's peaceable reign on earth and from our own church distinctive scriptures. We affirm the worth of every person with no exception. Hand in hand, we seek a better tomorrow. We hope for a better future, a future of what God wants for all of creation. John Whitmer was called to be the first church historian of early Latter-day Saintism. Interestingly, his family had Mennonite roots. He ended up dissenting from the authoritarian leadership of Smith and Rigdon and left the movement, refusing to change his history of the early church. He modeled honest, independent history, something we have also wanted to do. As our community started taking some of its new theological gains into uncharted territory, ordaining women and building our own peace temple or cathedral. This did not prove to be easy. The temple got built, but a rift opened between those who were opposed to women in the priesthood and those that continued with the church in its new strides. The community of Christ has two temples. One dedicated in 1836 is in Kirtland, Ohio. The other is in, in Independence, Missouri. A temple in community of Christ is a sacred place, like a European cathedral, but it's international rather than national or for a local diocese. As Jesus said, it's a place of prayer for all peoples. All are welcome to pray. Other Christians, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, etc., all are welcomed. The inside of the temple is simple and without images. Temples are places of learning, worship, inspiration, empowerment, and then being sent out in mission to bring peace and justice in the world. The temple in independence is dedicated specifically to the pursuit of peace reconciliation and healing of the spirit. The temple was dedicated for this purpose in 1994. Over the last 26 years, this has deepened the church's focus on the mission of creating peace and justice in the world. Every day at 1 p.m. there's a prayer for peace for one country. It takes six months to pray for every country in the world. The Independence Temple is also a place of learning about peace and justice in events like peace colloquies or conferences. Speakers include Nobel Peace Laureates and practice, practitioners of peace and justice that we want to learn from. We hold every four years an international youth forum and try to bring every teenager in the church to the temple to experience worship and learn about peace with other young people from all over the world. It's a pilgrimage for a church member to come to the temple and then to go home 
to help create peace where they live and work. Our name change in 2001 is significant. Now called Community of Christ, we seek to better reflect who we are becoming and continue to distance ourselves from the early violence and distortions of our movement. This new name reflected a long-standing bias or preferential theological emphasis on building communities of love, hope, joy, and peace, and still being named after the one that saves. A new name required a new theological language, identity, message, mission statement, and belief statement. Recent years have gone into clarifying who we are becoming and what our witness to the world should be. A movement where we ordain women, a repenting peace and justice church, for example. Informed by the best in our tradition, using the lens of Jesus to understand our scriptures, we have been embracing our LGBTQ siblings and are including them in the ministry and sacramental life of the church. Internationally, brothers and sisters from other nations are representing their own cultures within our movement. We learn from each other, accept the joys and challenges of our differences, but also discover what unites us together. So we're becoming a more inclusive community, a more diverse community, a more equal community, and a community better equipped to face changes happening in the 21st century. We want now to describe the church's position in relationship to, it, to other movements, other ideologies and theologies. We're inspired by the peace churches, Quakers and Mennonites, as we have already mentioned. Some members fear them, however, especially in the United States. We enthusiastically seek ecumenical relationships with Catholics and Protestants. We have embraced interfaith dialogue from uh, as far back as 1893. We have an uncomfortable relationship with our own conservatives, restorationists, who divided from us over the ordination of women. That was very painful. With the Mormon LDS church, we have a lot of cooperation in early church history research. We have dialogue between academics, but there's still pain and ambiguity. Politically, we would be closest to Greens and Social Democrats, but I'm sure some members vote for the Conservative Party in Britain. We should be critical of neoliberal economics, given our communal socialism beginnings. The far right is horrendous and violates, violates our sense of human decency. Probably 90% of members in the UK voted Remain in the Brexit referendum. We seek to resist resurgent nationalisms and hypermasculinity. We are suspicious of empire, be it political or corporate. How do we decide things? An early, an early statement on decision-making was this, and all things shall be done by common consent. We use parliamentary decision-making over non-controversial issues at our conferences, but for big decisions, which could divide the church, we have reclaimed our common consent tradition and devised common consent processes that can take a number of years. This has been used successfully for the LGBTQ issue, for example. We're currently in a period of worldwide common consent process on whether we will commit to nonviolence. We're also engaging on the topic of just peace, the official position of the World Council of Churches since 2011 and being investigated by the Vatican at this time. We will likely make a final decision on nonviolence at our World Conference in 2025. If we take this step, we will then have joined the peace church tradition with Quakers and Mennonites as a contemporary peace and justice church. Our repentance from our violent history would then be more complete. We're learning from the mistaken patriotism of World War I and World War II, identifying and telling the story of our conscientious objectives is important. Becoming an international church present in 60 countries relativizes everyone's nationalism, particularly through positive events like World Conference and other international gatherings. Every World Conference begins with singing, this is my song, O God of all the nations, a song of peace for lands afar and mine. 
we tried to bring every young person in their teenage years together to experience the Temple of Peace every four years and to meet each other. World Service Corps is a program for young adults to serve the church in other cultures and nations. We're a church with three official languages and work in about 14 languages in total. Perhaps more people speak French than English in the church, and on a Sunday morning, we're two thirds black or brown. We are often accused of being Emma Smith's church rather than the church of Joseph Smith Jr. We accept the compliment. We first gathered together against polygamy and church militarism, serious hypermasculine practices. In terms of the ordination of women, it is important to understand that our ordained ministry is a volunteer lay ministry throughout the church. In nearly every active family, there will be a priesthood member. So the ordination of women in our tradition has the potential of disrupting patriarchal habits in every active church family. That is why resistance by some was so strong. Our inclusive language style guide goes back nearly 50 years. Women now serve at every level of the church and full inclusion of LGBT persons from 2012 onwards is also a strong statement against hypermasculinity. However, the biggest argument against hypermasculinity is the example of Jesus of the Gospels, to wash the feet of others, to listen to women and ensure they always walk away with new dignity, to have time to bless children and courageous strength to suffer in the pursuit of justice nonviolently. In, in the first days of the church, blacks were ordained. In 1865, ordination of blacks was reaffirmed in Community of Christ. However, we confess that racism continues to be an issue that we have to address in ourselves. Nevertheless, the church's diversity committee continues its task of educating the church. The Black Lives Matter movement is a refreshing challenge for those of us who are white. The leading quorums of the church are multi-ethnic, multiracial, multinational, and multi-gendered. This is our story of how Community of Christ as a self-critical religious movement has tried to address the violences of nationalism, hypermasculinity, and white supremacy. We know we are not there yet, but we seek to be a progressive religious movement informed by the example of Jesus Christ of the Christian New Testament. Jesus of the Gospels is normative for us. We now invite your help, comments, suggestions, and critical feedback as we open for discussion. What do we still need to look at? In what ways can your studies inform and educate our movement? Can Community of Christ serve as a case study or a social laboratory for what is possible? What unwritten chapters and pages remain for our movement as we interact with the Peace Studies community? Thank you.